Um, I'm not talking about just a disagreement on one person sees Scripture this way and other people see Scripture this way. Um, been in good conversations with people over the years. Um, out in Kenya a couple years ago, I have unruly hair today. I need my mom to come and lick it, make it all pat down real good. If she walks in behind me, I'm running, all right? Uh, but anyway, just conversations with people over the years. I remember talking to a group in Kenya uh, back in 2011. We were just doing like a Q&A thing, question and answer. And um, it was, they, they, some of them were asking me my position on tongues and women preachers and things like that. And one of them in particular gave me scripture back and said, but what about this and this and this and this? And I went, I like you. Because you, you actually mentioned Scripture. You actually said the Bible says this. And I like that. So I'm not talking about when, when, I, when I deal with an issue. I, I don't like to just get into little disagreements between Bible believers. That's pointless. But some things are, are just grievous errors. Um. And I'll tell you what I mean here in a minute. There's an email, and I'm not going to read any names here. Um, this is someone who is asking me about the church they're going to. And I, I can't tell anybody that they should or should not go to a particular church. That's not my place. Um, but anyway, um, our, our Italian neighbors sent me an email. They have a question, and it just brought to mind something that I had heard a guy say, um, it says, Dear Pastor Mike, I have a question about Rev 2014. Now, for those of you who did not grow up in Sunday school, that is Revelation 2014. It says that hell and death are thrown into the lake of far, lake of fire. Does this make hell and the lake of fire separate places? And I say yes, and I look at it like this. Um, when someone dies, look at the story of the rich man in Luke 16. When he died, he lift up his eyes being in hell. Immediately, Lazarus at that time went to Abraham's bosom. Why do I say at that time? Because we know from scriptures that Jesus, when he died, his soul went to the lower parts of the earth, just like he said, for three days. What did he do there? He preached to those spirits in prison. He set captivity free. That's what he did. Um, there's a picture of that. God, I just, I love this. I love this part of knowing the Bible, that there is a picture of from what I can see, just about every doctrine that God has in the Bible. And you hear you have a picture in Genesis 40. That's interesting because the number four deals with the spiritual realm. And, in, and the four Gospels. Matthew's the 40th book of the Bible. Think about that. Here is in Genesis chapter 40, and we have Joseph, who is a type of Christ, and he is in prison and he didn't do anything wrong. He committed no sin. Who put him there? Who put him there? Mystery Babylon the Great. Dun, dun, dun. Why? She wanted to entice him. And he wouldn't have any part of it. So he gets thrown in prison. And two men had a dream. One of them was the baker and one of them was the butler of Pharaoh. The baker... He said, you're going to be lifted up, but you're going to be hung on a tree. That's the curse. Curse is anybody hangs on a tree. And then he said to the butler, you're going to be lifted up on the third day. I like that. In three days, you're going to be lifted up, and you're going to be set at the right hand of Pharaoh, bearing his cup once again. You're going to be restored. And so there was two groups that Jesus preached to. He preached the gospel to them. And some would say, well, the gospel wasn't around until after, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. Well, how did Jesus preach the gospel to them then? It's the everlasting gospel, which means it always was, is, always shall be. 
So he's preaching the gospel to those people. He's preaching it, number one, to those in Abraham's bosom who have died. How? Doing works? No. These all died, Peter, uh, Paul said in Hebrews, in faith. That's how they died. They went to Abraham's bosom, and Jesus set them free. Then we have the group that Jesus is preaching to, where Jesus is saying, you should have believed. You should, and by the way, you angels, shame on you. Should have never married those women. You were told not to do it. You did it anyway. So anyway, I'm making a long story short. Or I'm making a long story very long. Here's the thing. That area called hell is the holding place of all of those who die outside of faith. At some point, Revelation, I just, I've been making notes on a certain subject this morning that's just really got my attention. I'm not ready to talk yet. I've been praying about it. You know, God, show me. God, give me light. Here's the verses, but I have to understand them first. And I'm, I'm going to skip over what I was just going to say. But at the end, God takes death and hell, and he casts them into the lake of fire. Think about when someone commits a crime and they're arrested, they're taken to the city jail or the county jail, and they're held for what? Their arraignment and their trial. Once they are tried, if they are found guilty... Then what happens? They're taken to prison and cast into prison for, in some cases, for life, for what amounts to eternity. So think of it like that. Now, here is a question that they also had um, in Matthew twenty-two fourteen. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Matthew or your King James Pure Bible Search software. And uh, we're going to look at some verses in Matthew. I heard of a preacher. Somebody wrote me an email, and they were questioning something they heard their pastor say because it didn't sound right to them. And they were going to a King James church, and they said that their pastor told them that there is a place in heaven that is a place of outer darkness. And it's where saved people go who didn't do enough good works to merit the mansion. And, I, and I'm just, in my mind, I'm going, what? This, it is where the saved people go who, who they say they were saved, but they rejected the faith. They went out and did drugs. They went out and slept with a bunch of women. They were into witchcraft. They were whatever. And they still get to go to heaven, but they have to go to the outer darkness part of heaven. Not with the rest of us good Christians. And I went, that's nuts. That's insane. The question is, um, in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, 14, it says, the man without a wedding garment is cast into the outer darkness. Is this hell? Let's go look that up. You pull up the King James Pure Bible search software, look at outer darkness, three places in your King James Bible, all of them in the book of Matthew. The, isn't that interesting? The 40th book of the Bible. That's pretty cool. And you notice something, that every time I bring up the King James Pure Bible Search software, my face just lights up. Did you see that? It just lights up. It's just, there's, there's light in that word. Here it is again. Isn't it cool? Anyway, Matthew chapter 8. Let's, let's walk circumspectly around Matthew 8, 12. Let's look and see what this says. Let's go back to verse 5. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him 
and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. And I will tell you what, can't wait to meet that guy in heaven. He's got it right. He's got his head on straight. He's not one of these that thinks he's saved and he's cocky and arrogant about it. I am worthy, bless God. God's made me worthy. You come in my house anytime. In fact, I will let you come into my house. I've heard people talk like that. It makes me sick. He said, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And you know what? I love this centurion. You know what? He, he's recognizing Jesus' authority. Jesus, I know about authority. I say to this guy, go, and he goes. If you would just say the word, that palsy will go. He recognized Jesus' authority. And so when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed. And this centurion was a Gentile. He said, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Look at what he says in verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Who do you think those children of the kingdom are? I think it's Israel. I think it's the, the Jews who were living at that time and probably before and afterward who will not have faith in Christ and trust him and believe in him. And he said, they're going to be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty two thirteen. Here's another story. Um, you know, it's about the wedding. Remember that? Uh, let's go back to the, let's go back to verse one. And Jesus answered and spake unto them. This is Matthew twenty two. He spake unto them by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. I wonder who that is. I wonder who that could be. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Israel. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner, uh, and my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come into the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. That's what Israel did to her prophets. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. What happened to Jerusalem? just about 37 years after Christ died. So he says, verse 9, Go ye therefore, uh, he says in verse 8, Then saith he to the servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. That's Jesus sending the Holy Spirit and his disciples out, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. And so all of us Gentiles, both good and bad, redneck and sophisticated, we get invited to the marriage feast. Now verse 11, when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know what this story is about? There's lots of people who come to church that are not dressed and what I mean by that is that they do not have the righteous garments of Jesus Christ on them. They have decided to uh, try to enter in by their own merit or their own goodness 
or how great they are in men's eyes, but they have not been clothed upon by Christ himself. What happens to church members when they are not dressed? They are cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30 is the last place you find this in the scriptures. Uh, or at least outer darkness. And while I'm doing this, you could look up the word gnashing. G-N-A-S-H-I-N-G. And look for other verses in the Bible where they are gnashing their teeth. Matthew 25, this is about the, uh, the servants. There are some who try to use this passage as a way of telling people there are levels in heaven and the really, really good Christians, they get the top levels in heaven and the bad Christians stay in the outer darkness part of heaven, which is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous, people, to say that. That's irresponsible. That's not Scripture. That is jamming your theology into the Bible to make it fit. That's putting a square peg in a round hole. And you've got to use a lot of force and go after, and you got to hit it often to get a square peg into a round hole. That's what these people are doing. Look at, look at this, and how do I know? And I've had this used against me. I've had this passage used against me because I teach that the inheritance of the saint is the Lord. And just the parable that Jesus taught about uh, the... the um, the husbandman needing workers in the field. So he hires some guys 6 o'clock in the morning. How much you pay? Pays a penny a day. So they go out and work. Realizes there's not enough. Hires some guys at noon. What does it pay? Penny a day. So they go out and work. Some guys come in 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, you got any work left? Yeah, we got a ton of work. Work till dark. How much does it pay? A penny. And the people that started work early, they, they went back, and when they got their penny, and they saw the other guys get their penny, and they said, hey, wait a minute. We're from the union hall. That's unfair labor practice. That was pretty good, wasn't it? You're paying us a penny, and they, you paid them a penny. And the master said, when you walked in here, did you not agree to work today for a penny? Well, yeah. Well, that's how much it pays then. It pays a penny. You know what that means? It's equal. There are some people who serve God all their life, not for wages, not for more money, not for a bigger mansion in heaven. They serve God all their life because they love God. And there are some people, like my brother-in-law, who committed just about every sin that you can find in the Bible without sodomy. In the last few months of his life, I saw a different man. The last week of his life, he came to me wanting to know for sure that he was going to heaven. I had no idea he was going to die that week, and he did. He spent the whole week. His son told me, he said, I'd just walk in Dad's house. He'd be sitting there reading his Bible. He was telling everybody in the world about what's going to happen when he dies and how he's going to go to heaven and this and that and the other. My brother-in-law wasted 99% of his life fulfilling the lusts and the desires of his flesh, and God saved him. Should he get a less reward than somebody that's worked all their lives when, in fact, the people who really are working for God are doing it for free anyway. We're not working for God so God can take good care of us and pay our bills and make us wealthy. I'm, I'm working for God because I love God. And he's done something for me, and this is what I want to do back. And I've had this passage used against me to prove that there are different 
payment levels in heaven. I want you to look at the language of your King James Bible. Verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. And I want you to listen to this. That several ability. We know that God gives out the measure of grace severally. That means one gets it a little bit different than the other. And let me tell you this. The guy that has served God out of a pure heart all of his life, he was able to serve God all of his life without wavering. I saw my brother-in-law come to the Lord prior to the last few months of his life, but it was the most shaky, rocky thing I'd ever experienced in my life. There was just so many sins that had a hold on him, he was not able to. To live a decent life, not until the last few months of his life. You understand that? Who saves people on their deathbed? God. Why? Maybe God knows something that we don't understand. Maybe God knows about that person. They wouldn't have stuck with it if they'd have got saved when they were 15 or 20 or whatever, or they came to the Lord. They wouldn't have stuck with it. I'm just, this is what it says. Every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord unto sent, said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I want you to mark what exactly Jesus said to the man who brought back five talents. I want you to look at every word. Now, Look at verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And I'm going to ask you a question. What is it that's different between the two blessings? Not a word. Both of these... The five-talent guy and the two-talent guy, they receive the exact same words of blessing. No difference between them. Now look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I, now watch this. You hear this guy? You hear his heart? He don't love his Lord. He thinks his God or his Lord or his master is mean and a cheat. That's what he thinks of him. He's got a hard heart. He's not coming to his master, glad that he's back, worshiping him, honoring him. I've done my best. He's not doing that. He's mouthing off. He said, I was afraid, went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast thou that, that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. He called him wicked. Mm. Called him wicked. And he said, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. And unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I, somebody told me that their pastor, or some visiting guy in their church, or whatever, told them that the wicked servant still gets to go to heaven, but he doesn't get the good part of heaven like the good servant does. 
he has to go to the part of heaven that's called outer darkness. People, that's a lie. That man lied through his teeth. Let me, um, in Matthew 13, 42, I told you to look up the word gnashing. In verse 41 of Matthew 13, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's hell, people. Luke 13. Um, verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know ye not whence ye are. Then ye shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou wast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. That's not heaven. That is a furnace of fire, Matthew 13. And then, uh, this lady, I, again, I cannot tell you where to go to church. And I, I said as much in my response to her. Um, listen to this. She said, I'm noticing in my church, they make very wrong and bold statements, such as, I want you to get ready for this one, such as, they are so confident of their salvation that they know they can renounce their belief and die in this state of unbelief and still be saved. And this person writes to me and says, I don't see this in Scripture. I keep thinking of the Scripture that says, if we deny Christ before men, he will deny us before our Father. Is this a damnable heresy? Let me tell you what it is. And I mentioned this last week. Dave, my friend Dave, knows a pastor that claims that as a saved person, he could go take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. That is, that is exactly... The devil took Jesus up to that high mountain. And he said, Jesus, why don't you just jump? Why don't you cast yourself off of here? Because doesn't the Bible say that he shall give his angels charge over thee, and they shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone? Hmm, doesn't the Bible say that? And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And it appears to me that people, again, they're taking their religious view, they're taking a square peg and trying to drive it into a round hole, and they are tempting God with it by saying, I can take the mark of the beast, and God has to save me. Or I can renounce Jesus and become a witch and a sodomite, and God has to save me. Folks, that's wicked. That's wicked. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. I, I'm not anybody's judge. If the men who have said things like that, and I suspect that there's more than just two in the world, if the men who have said that are not chastened by God and corrected by God from that, 
What does that say about whether or not they are sons of God? Folks, if it's not in the Bible, don't believe it. Don't believe it. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, now this is me, okay? And I'm, I'm pr probably a little different than a lot of people. If I was sitting in this guy's church, and I would have heard with my ears him saying that, I would have yanked my kids up and my wife and said, let's go. There's no way in the world I'm going to sit and let my family listen to this. No way, no how. Um, you do what God tells you to do. He may want you there for a reason. I don't know that. So, anyway, I'm praying for you. Uh, let's see what's going on in this evil world that we live in. Russian researchers expose breakthrough U.S. spying program. Did you see this one? This is a big... The U.S. National Security Agency has figured out how to hide spying software deep within hard drives. Listen to this. Made by Western Digital, Seagate, and Toshiba, and other top manufacturers. Giving the agency the means to eavesdrop on the majority of the world's computers, according to cyber researchers and former operatives. The long-sought and closely guarded ability was part of a cluster of spying programs discovered by Kaspersky Lab. You may have used Kaspersky's products. They, they sell, they make, manufacture, and sell antivirus, anti-malware, anti-this, anti-that. That's what they do. And it's primarily for Windows machines. Perpetually. Ever since Windows 3.1, Windows seems to be the most vulnerable operating system in the entire universe for hacking, malware, viruses, things like that. If you can use the software that's made for Linux machines, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Um, Linux... For what I do on a daily basis, they don't have, in my opinion, very good video editing software. They don't have streaming software like I'm using right now. They do have some, but it's, it's not near as advanced as what I'm, I'm using Wirecast right now. And so there are some things that I, I just can't do. But one of my office machines is a Linux machine, and it's the one in my office where, if you remember, I came in on a Sunday morning and the blue light on my webcam was on. And I noticed it and I said out loud, why is that blue light on? And it blinked and went off as soon as I said it. Dun, dun, dun. So I quickly installed Linux on there. You know why? It's hard to get through. But anyway, uh, Kaspersky Lab, the Moscow-based self, uh, security software maker that has exposed a series of Western cyber espionage operations. Kaspersky, Kaspersky, that's easy for you to say. Kaspersky said it found personal computers in 30 countries infected with one or more of the spying programs with the most infections seen in Iran, Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Mali, Syria, Yemen, and Algeria. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what this is. The United States of America, or specifically the government agencies of the United States of America, are making us to stink in the eyes and in the nostrils of the world. Because of the presidency that we've had for the last eight years, six years, because of the National Security Administration, the NSA, the CIA, there is a growing list of nations around the world that despise the United States of America. Why? 
because we felt like, or let's say government agencies felt like, they had a right to snoop and spy, even on our allies, even on nations that we are friends with. This administration and the current climate that's in the CIA, NSA, has made even our allies angry at us because we've been spying on them the whole time. But I want you to think about this. I just bought four brand new hard drives for our computer systems here at the church. Ter one terabyte, two terabytes. Because video stuff, everything that we do, it just eats up a lot of drive space. And we just need more. Uh, we use cloud services, and thank God, two of the cloud services that we use just increase the amount of data that we can store in there. And so we archive every broadcast, and we're able to do that. But here's the thing. I just purchased spyware. I just did. These, let's see, where is the one? Where is it? I don't remember what I did with it. Um, one of those, I think one of those hard drives is Western Digital. But we are, we are, our, our government, not the people of America, our government is making us to stink in the opinions of nations all the way around the world. We got, a, we got a hard time as a nation, people. The world is turning to, instead of loving America and admiring America and thinking of America as the good guys, well, we just decided to throw prayer, Bible reading out of our schools. A long time ago, we decided to abort millions of our own children. We've decided to flaunt homosexuality and be in everybody's face with it. That's what we decided to do, and now the world says, are you kidding me? I wouldn't live in America on a bet. Um, speaking of hard drives, scientists store data inside DNA that could last millions of years. Just one gram of DNA. I didn't know DNA was sold by the gram. Anyway. Just one gram of DNA can store the equivalent of 14,000 Blu-ray discs. Wow. Think about that. Let me see if I can do the math. What does a Blu-ray disc hold? About 25 gigs? I um, think about the progress of computers. The first... Um, IBM clone, they called it back in the 90s, I bought. Um, I can't remember what brand it was. But I ended up paying 1500 bucks for a monitor, a dot matrix printer, and um, a PC running Windows 3.1 that had two megabytes of memory in it. And an 85 megabyte hard drive, buddy. And my wife said, is that going to be big enough? And I'm going, oh. Man, you'd be amazed at what I can do with an 85 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> and now we're dealing with gigabytes. Now we're dealing with multiple gigabytes. Let's see here. 25 gigs on a Blu-ray disc times, let's see how to do this, 14,000. 350,000 gigabytes. In one gram of DNA, I think I think I did that right. One gram of DNA. Although the potential for DNA as an alternative to hard drives has been known about for years, it is not the most reliable and secure way to keep data safe. The latest breakthrough could be about to change that. However, now I want you to get, I want you to kind of use your imagination for a minute and see where this is going. You remember that mark of the beast thing where it says nobody can buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name? Now they're turning computers in, or they're turning DNA into computers. 
storage media using they could they could probably in the near future figure out a way of using the DNA that you already have in your body as one giant massive storage container of information and data it just it's it's staggering to think about the potential of where we're headed in the next 5, 10, 20 years. And I've said this before. The technological news that's coming out is on a daily basis the amount of breakthroughs that are being announced in these days. Breakthroughs that once they are known and implemented, they lead to more breakthroughs. And it's going to happen. The rate the way Ray Kurzweil said, it's going to be geometric in its scale or in its improvement. Technology is going to develop at such a rapid pace that at some point they're already predicting computers to be self-aware in the next decade. From 2020 on, computers becoming self-aware of themselves. The Google dog, you remember seeing that? The thing, you can kick it, and it'll, it'll keep itself upright. It won't let itself fall down. That's all fun and games until the Google robot gets sick and tired of that guy kicking me, and he kicks back. Am I making this up? Am I making too much out of this? I don't think so. Not when we're being warned, even by Stephen Hawking, who doesn't believe in Bible prophecy. Stephen Hawking is warning everybody, I think this singularity thing, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think making self-aware computers and robots is going to work out for our advantage. And Stephen Hawking uses robotics and he uses computers to communicate and move around in this world. He's dependent on them. He writes books and gives speeches by way of computer voice. He, he, moves, he moves a cursor with his eyes and selects words on a page and makes sentences out of it, and the computer talks for it. It's really neat. But even Hawking said, this is not going, it's not going to turn out good. I saw the movie. I watched, I watched the Terminator movies. It's not, it's not good. So I want you to think about this. They put, they put information on a strand of DNA, but that's not very secure. Are they, going to, are they going to use some sort of system whereby the DNA of whatever computer system that is, the storage media, they have the information, you want the information, whatever it is, a bank transaction, um, a download an ebook or a movie or whatever it is. They have the information. You, they are selling the information. You want the information, so you will buy the information. See it? Buying and selling. But not just anybody can hack that information and get it out. The information provider has to detect in your DNA something I don't know what it is, but it has to detect something in your DNA that separates you out as different from being other people in the world who don't have that difference. Think about so that no man, no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And as long as we live in this cash society, that's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. And so that's led some people to, they invest heavily in gold and silver. I've got gold bars. They're going to they're gonna ride out the, the, the empire of the beast because they've got gold. And James said, your gold is cankered. It's no good. You tried to store that up for the last days, and God's just laughing at you because you think that's going to save you, and it's not. Um. The article says DNA lends itself to this task as it can store large amounts of information in a compact manner. Unfortunately, the data is not always retrievable, error-free. Gaps and in false information in the encoded data arise through chemical degradation and mistakes in DNA sequencing. 
We have revealed how the long-term, error-free storage of information can be achieved potentially for more than a million years. Listen to this. In 2013, researchers demonstrated that data could be saved and read from DNA. But during tests, um, but during tests, the time between writing the information and reading the information was relatively short. Even during this time, mistakes were spotted in the writing and reading of the data stored on the DNA. Over a longer term, DNA can change significantly as it reacts chemically with the environment, and this is the biggest obstacle to using DNA as a long-term storage option. With this in mind, Professor Grass, that's interesting, Professor Grass, uh, took inspiration from fossilized bones. Deep, uh, despite being thousands of years old, it, it is possible to obtain genetic material found within the bones of, uh, let's see, where's the rest of this article here? Found within the bones, dinosaur bones. He concluded that this DNA is protected because it is encapsulated and protected. With this in mind, he devised a way to protect the information bearing DNA with a synthetic fossil shell in the same way. His team began encoding Switzerland's Federal Charter of 1291 and the methods of mechanical theorems by Archimedes in the DNA. The researchers then placed the DNA segments into spheres of silica. You know what that is? You know what silica is? Sand. Can you think of something in the Bible, a story that has sand in it? Um... Anyway, spheres of silica with a diameter of roughly, roughly 150 nanometers. In order to stimulate the degradation of DNA over a long period of time, research is stored it at a temperature between 140 degrees and 158 degrees for up to a month. These high temperatures replicate the chemical degradation that takes place over hundreds of years within just a few weeks. By doing this, the researchers could compare the storage of DNA in silica glass with other common storage methods such as impregnated filter paper and in biopolymer. The, to make a long story short, they figured out how to store information in DNA and then save it so that it doesn't degrade, so that nothing happens to it. And I want you to, I, I want you to think about something, okay? And, and I, I'm going to, we're going to go study something here in just a little bit. Um, I've been dealing with Matthew 24 for a little while here on this program. Why? Do I have an agenda to try to prove how everybody's wrong and only Mike Hoggart is right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's vanity. That's wickedness. I, I have no such agenda. I do, however, totally believe that everything in the Bible could and should be looked at with fresh eyes. What's the harm in that? I'm not about changing anything that's in the Bible. I, do, I have such a high regard of scriptures that if the Bible says this is this and this and this, and then that is exactly what I believe. I may not understand it. That is what I believe. There's people asking me, do you believe, are you, are you uh, heliocentric or geocentric? You know what that means? Heliocentric means the earth and everything revolves around the sun. The sun revolves in this galaxy thing. And, there, you know, Galileo came up with that. When as before, everybody was geocentric, which means that the earth actually doesn't move. And everything moves around the earth. Now, I'm just going to give you what I think. A guy, I had a guy send me a book on this several years ago. And I th was thinking, oh, this one of them flat earth dudes. <sighs> we know that's not true. We know that's not true. The earth is a circle, just like God said it was. But I'm looking at that, and I get the gist that this guy's talking about geocentricity, the fact that the earth doesn't move. And he's got a bunch of things written in there. Me, I don't care what he said. I want to look at the, and I started looking at the scriptures. And he, was, he used a King James Bible, which really got my attention. 
I went and just looked at the scriptures that the man had in the book. When I read just the scriptures, I closed the book and I thought, you know what? It looks like to me that the Bible says the earth doesn't move. That's what it looks like to me. When Joshua, on the day of that longest day, that battle day, Joshua chapter 10, go read what Joshua wanted done. Joshua did not command the earth to stand still. He commanded the sun and the moon. Now, we know the moon rotates around the earth. We know that. He commanded the moon to stand still and the sun to stand still. Does not Psalm 19 talk about the sun going in his, I don't think it's Psalm 19, somewhere, the sun going in his circuits? So you know what? I may not understand the mechanics of all that, but if you were to lay me down, put a gun to my nose and say, are you heliocentric or geocentric? I would have to say, I believe the earth stands still. I believe the earth is established that it cannot be moved forever. That's scripture, by the way. So anyway, and here's my point. Who in the world studied Bible prophecy 30 years ago? Let's just go back 30 years. What was 30 years ago? 1980, 1984. Ooh, 1984. Let's go back, let's go back to the 70s. Let's go back to the days of Hal Lindsey and um, the Thief in the Night movie. You remember that? If you don't, if you don't go, go to YouTube and watched A Thief in the Night. I don't remember, I don't know whose ministry put it out, but this was back in the 70s when uh, there were several companies that would send your church a film, a movie on a big reel. And we had one of those movie projectors in our church and we would show movies like The Burning Hell. That one really get, got my attention. And we would watch A Thief in the Night about the rapture. Who in 1974 or 1984 or even 1994, who knew anything about DNA and how it could be altered? Who was looking at the scriptures in 1974? In Psalm 139, in thy book, all my members were written. Who was looking in the Bible at 1974 and saying, I think that's DNA? Nobody was. Nobody was doing that. Am I saying that I'm better than anybody else simply because I say that? No, absolutely not. I live in a different time. I live in a different time. I live in a time where knowledge is increased over what it was in 1974. And when I look at Psalm 139, and I recognize DNA is called a book in the Bible, and I look in Revelation 22 and see the rules for that book. You cannot add to it. You cannot take anything away from it. Essentially, don't rewrite it. When I look at Psalm 22, in light of articles like this, I get it. I understand they're doing exactly what the creator, the author, the author of the book, of my DNA, they're doing exactly what the author said don't do. The author of my DNA still holds the copyright. He has not authorized anybody to change one word. And in 1974, no one even imagined thinking this way. But here we are now in, in 2015 looking at stories like this, and we go to the Scripture and we say, this is that which was spoken by David. This is that which was spoken by Christ. This is that which was spoken by Ezekiel. We can look at the Bible in with those eyes. Eyes of the knowledge of the world around us. Eyes with the idea that man is on a journey to become a god. How? 
by altering his DNA, by using technology to conform and work along with the human body. We are turning mankind into a machine, a computer. That's what we're doing. Only, only a few adventurous sci-fi writers were even thinking this way, 1974, 1975. So again, I don't think it hurts anybody unless you're just so dug in on a certain idea, I don't think it hurts anybody. And even at that, it's not, I don't want to hurt you if I look at Matthew 24 with, or, first, or first Thessalonians 4 or 2 Thessalonians 2. If I look at these places, 1 Corinthians 15, if I look at these passages with fresh eyes, how does that hurt you? Because if I'm wrong, and you know me to be wrong, then the one thing that I hope you would do is go back to the King James Bible and hit it hard and study it and sharpen yourself on what the Word of God says. That's what I would hope you would do. Am I capable of error? <laughs> I'm good at it. Um, speaking of capable of error... I, what time is it? I better get moving along here. I'm accident prone. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but I am accident prone. I've been in um, three or four car accidents, um, and none of them was my fault. I'm not making that up. I've been rear-ended three times. Side hit one time in an intersection. I was in a funeral procession. I fall. I hurt myself all the time. And I'm, I've got a back issue. I got another back issue now from when I fell back in November. And um, I'm going to have to have it looked at because it's getting to where it's affecting my mobility. So you help me pray about that. So am I capable of error? Shoot, you don't know the half of it. Um, let me just run through this very quickly. Uh, Iraqi Christians believe that Christians go through tribulation. Jihadist militants from the Islamic State, ISIS, will not they just call it ISIS like they did? Because that's who's responsible for this. She hates Christians. She hates them. Jihadist militants from the Islamic State have burned to death 45 people in the western Iraqi town of al-Baghdadi, the local police chief says. Exactly who those people were and why they were killed is not clear, but Colonel Qasim al-Obaidi said he believes some were members of the security forces. ISIS fighters captured much of the town near Ain al-Assad Air Base last week. This is happening more and more and more. ISIS, terrorist groups, going after Jews, going after Christians. That spirit, Mystery Babylon, hates Christians. It hates God's people. The remnant of her seed, Israel, hates God's people. She always has. She always will. And ask these people if they believe that Christians go through tribulation. Uh, what else is going here? Woman shot by police was like a zombie. Did you read about that? What was that in uh, Australia? At Hungry Jack. I would love to go eat at a Hungry Jack. I would love that. Um, was she demon-possessed? Look like it. Student reprimanded for saying, God bless America. A uh, Florida high school student was disciplined after a national atheist organization took offense when he concluded the morning announcements by saying, God bless America. How petty, how petty do you have to be and how insecure do you have to be in your ideology that you cannot bear, you cannot bear psychologically as an atheist someone saying, God bless America. 
You are so shallow in your belief that just the mere mention of the word God means that if I hear that word one more time, I might start believing in him. Stupid world we live in. Uh, Democrats on the FEC open to new regulations. They're going to they're gonna regulate the Internet. What else? What else? Very quickly. CNN news anchor. During a heated discussion over gay marriage, CNN morning anchor Chris Cuomo opined that the unalienable rights endowed to all Americans do not come from God. <laughs> Cuomo was debating Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore on the... Con By the way, the Supreme Court, what was it, Alabama was told by the courts that they had to honor gay marriage. Roy Moore and, and some other judges in Alabama are saying, no, we're not doing it. There's going to be a showdown over this thing. You watch and see. And I appreciate Roy Moore and his stand and what he's, he's the guy that had the Ten Commandments in his courtroom. And these very weak-minded atheists who get so offensed at the name or the word God, they're afraid that somebody is going to turn to religion because the word God is somewhere. They sued and got their way, and they had the Ten Commandments thrown out of his court, and he stood his ground. He's standing his ground again. Here's Cuomo debating Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore on the Constitution of the Same-Sex Marriage. Near the end of the back and forth, uh, and after Moore argued that rights cannot be handed down by men, Cuomo blurted out, Our rights do not come from God, Your Honor, and you know that. They come from man. That's your faith. That's my faith. But that's not our country. Our laws come from collective agreement and compromise. The Cuomo sissified guy said. Maybe Mr. Cuomo flunked elementary civics. The opening sentence of the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence clearly affirms, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's what our Declaration of Independence said. It said that the rights that we have are already given to us by God. It is the role of government to secure those rights, not take them away. Our rights do not, my right to keep and bear an arm, a pistol, a gun, a knife. My right to keep and bear a gun does not come to me from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. When the Second Amendment was written, it was assumed that everybody already had the right to arm themselves. Because it doesn't say, Second Amendment doesn't say, uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall be given by the Congress of the United States. It doesn't say that. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be be affringed. We already have the right to carry weapons given to us by God. Why did God give us the right to carry weapons? Because there's people out there who are bad, evil, mean, and they, won't, they don't sit down over coffee, and you can negotiate how you're going to hand over your wife to them so they can rape her. They're not going to do that. So you have to keep and bear arms. God gave you that right. It's up to the government to not infringe on in those rights and secure those rights. Anyway, all oh, let's see here. What is everybody? Uh, yeah, I see that. Yep, I just saw that article. DNA and hard drives. And um, uh, let's see here. Derek says, I feel like you missed who Jesus gave the one talent, man's talent to. He gave it to the one with 10. Therefore, he got 11 talents, not 10. Verse 21 and verse 23 might be the same words of blessing, but in the end, the one with 10 got more. So, 
What's he going to do with it? What does a guy do with 11 talents that a guy with five talents can't do in heaven? I mean, I, I get what you're saying. But here, here's what you do, Derek. King James Pure Bible Search Software. Download it, install it on your Linux, Mac, or Windows. Does it sound like I'm selling it to you? Shouldn't, because I don't get any money out of it. All I want you to do is study the Word. Study the Word. Look up the word inherit or inheritance. Look that word up. Go all through the Scriptures. You know what you'll find out? I'll let you find it out. Okay? I'll let you find it out. Now, here's what I do believe. I absolutely believe that when we come back and reign with Christ for a thousand years, I don't understand it all, but I do believe some are given greater responsibility than others. There's even a, there's, there's even a picture of that in the Bible. It's so cool. Go study when Jethro came to Moses and said, Moses, you're sitting here judging everybody's little petty little thing. You need help. You can't do this all day long. Why don't you get, you go read Jethro's conversation with Moses, and you'll see that there was a tear of judgment responsibility. There was a judge down here that judged over little matters amongst a small group of people. There was a higher judge, just like in the United States, there was a higher judge who had a greater responsibility. And then finally, all the really big stuff went to Moses, just like in the United States of America. That I agree to. That I believe in. But this nonsense, this nonsense, Derek, that there is a place in heaven that is a place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Derek, I love you. I'm not angry at you. I'm angry at irresponsible preachers who preach this garbage. That's who I'm angry at. And um, anyway, Derek, you, 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 have a, you have a valid point here. I think that it applies to the millennial kingdom. I do not believe and do not preach and will never preach that I am better than somebody else. Therefore, I will get more than somebody else will. I don't think that's right. It doesn't sound right. It's not fair either. I don't want it that way. To be honest with you, I do not want it that way. I don't want to receive more while somebody else I care about receives less. Maybe that's why I believe what I believe. I don't know. But I'm just saying to you, I believe that there is a millennial reign application to that. But when you're saved, you're saved. And the Lord is your great and eternal reward. The Lord is. Anyway, here... Hi, Pastor Mike. God bless you. I just wanted to ask or suggest if you can have a day to explain the cult of Islam. My pastor said that in this end times, we're just going to have to have a religious war, Christianity versus Islam. And I see how Islam is growing rapidly in this country, but I don't know how to expose this religion. Have you done any studies? Please share. I have not. I have not done an in-depth study on Islam. Okay? Um, and so anyway, I... Uh, there's a couple little things I know. The Kaaba, I mean, I get it. I see their mosques with the four strong towers on it, north, south, east, and west. They're practicing witchcraft is what it is. Uh, but to the depth, I, I've just not studied it. It's just not been someplace where God's been leading me, all right? There are others, I think, who, are, who would probably have done a better job than I would in discussing Islam. Is there going to be a religious war in this country. I don't know. I don't know. Every, I'll be honest with you, though, every time I get up and I hear another news story about how Islamic terrorists killed these people or raped these people or burned alive these people or slit the heads off of other people, 
Every time I see Facebook postings with some Islamic dude holding some guy's head or some baby's head, I utter to myself, I hate that religion. I hate it. I do. Uh, Rick Warren can go join him if he wants to. I want nothing to do with it. Let's study our Bibles, people. Let's go to the Word of God. You follow along with me. You can either open your Bible or you can go to the Pure Bible Search software. All right? John 14. I'd I like to use this passage in funerals that I do, um, especially if I know that they are a believer. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. My heating pad turned off. How did it come? It turned off. There we go. This place in the in the it's in the middle of my back. If it gets cool or it gets cold, I'm telling you, it hurts, 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 hurts. And so my mom said, "Why don't you put ice on it, son?" And I went, "No, no, no ice. Need heat." Uh, anyway, in my father's house <clears throat> are many rooms. Did I just say that? Did I just say rooms? I've got a room just over the hilltop. See, it doesn't sound right, does it? That's what the NIV says. In my father's house are many rooms. My father runs the very best Western hotel, and he has many rooms. It just doesn't sound right, does it? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Underline that. Mark that down. Make a note of it. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. This is what I'm looking forward to, the reception. I'm looking forward to the reception for Jesus to receive me unto himself. Well, I like that. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Mary. No, it doesn't say that either. But by me. So we have it, we have it right out of the mouth of Jesus himself. Because some people don't believe it. And to me, it's very simple. And, and I'll tell you, let me tell you this. I'll tell you why some people don't believe in the translation or the, what they call the rapture. Okay? And let me, let me say this, too. Using the term rapture is not like saying, you know, like some bad word. Okay? Rapture is an English word based upon a Latin word that means caught up, okay? We, we use the terminology of rapture to describe like being caught up at a symphony orchestra concert playing, uh, you know, Beethoven's Ode to Joy or the Hallelujah Chorus by Handel, which one of my favorite things in the world is to listen to Handel's Messiah, the whole thing, and to be caught up in the rapture of emotion at the swelling of the music and the words of God mixed in there. It's just, it's, it's, I love that terminology. So I'm not one that says, oh, you said rapture, you're going to burn in hell. I don't say that, Okay. But to help people out, to clarify what I'm talking about, I use the word translation. That's what the Bible says. And the word rapture is the first cousin of the phrase caught up. Okay, 
goes through Latin and then to English, it means the same thing. So anyway, if you hear me say rapture throughout all this, it's just so that people can understand. There's, it's a commonly used term that people associate with this one event. But here's my thing. How can somebody not believe in it? I'll tell you how they, I'll tell you how they ended up not believing in it. They read a book, or they read a website blog, or they watched a YouTube video, and they heard this story about this lady who saw it in a vision, and, or this guy said this. And so they've told themselves in their minds, there is no translation of the Gentile church. There is no rapture. That's not going to happen. But the, they never read the Bible and said it's not going to happen. Because you can't. You can't read the Bible all the way through, close it, and say, I don't know where people get this rapture thing from. I have no idea where they get that from. They got that from Darby. They got that from this person. Or they, it was a Jesuit setup. That's what it was, the Jesuits. They came up with it. I've heard that one too. Let me just read this to you again. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's exactly what our Savior said. He's coming here. He's coming back to receive us unto himself. Why don't you believe that? And you say, well, I, you know, the timing of it. Oh, we're not talking about timing right now. We're talking about whether or not it's going to happen. This is the process that when I... When I decided I was going to toss all of my prophetic training, all my eschatological viewpoints, and study the Scripture and say, God, you teach it to me now. Is there going to be a rapture? I just decided and assumed that it wasn't there until God showed me the Scriptures. Why? That's a big question. Why is there going to be a translation? Why is there going to be a rapture? That's a really important question. There's an answer in the Bible. Look in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud, you see, he was taken up. He was raptured. That's what it means. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Where did he go? He went up into heaven. How did he get there? A cloud. Go study, go study clouds. Okay, God rides, God rides clouds. I think it's cool. Anyway, and a cloud received him out of their sight. What took Elijah to heaven? What took him up there? We'll get there in a minute. And while they stead, looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So now I have two verses now that tell us that he is coming back. When he comes back, he's coming back to receive us unto himself, and number two, he's coming back in a cloud. That's what it says. You saw Jesus go up in a cloud. When he comes back, he's coming back in a cloud. You ask yourself the question, where are we supposed to meet Jesus? Where are we supposed to meet him? We'll see that in a minute. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Turn there. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay. I was just looking, uh, looking at an email here. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. It's got authority, doesn't it? By the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord... Think about that. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent, and if you look it up, it means occur prior to, okay? Not keeping it from happening. It occurs prior to. So let's look at it like this. Shall not occur prior to them which are asleep. And we know that that's the meaning of it by what follows. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with, let's do this, a shout. That's the first thing. The second thing, the voice of the archangel. That's the second. Number three, with the trump of God. Number four, the dead in Christ shall rise first. See, that's the Bible is being its own dictionary. We are not going to proceed ahead, prevent those that are asleep or those who have already died. They are going to rise first out of the grave. How? 1 Corinthians 15 will tell us how. Then we which are, so the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's number four. Now we have five. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. In the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I want, to, uh, I want to do something. There are some who say, because it mentions the trump. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 that it's not just any old trump. It's the last trump. So, some say Revelation 4 that Paul meant the last trump before the tribulation. That's what some people say. And they say that Revelation 4 is a picture of the rapture, and it happens before the unsealing of the book and the seven trumpets and the seven vials. Let's look at Revelation 4 and see what it says, because some people will say that and not read the Scripture. Some will, but let's look at what the Scripture says. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. So they, they're looking at the phrase, Come up hither. And then it says in verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, and we've, I've covered Revelation 4 several times, you know, about the, it's the picture of the body temple and so on. I love this chapter. But here's my, here's my problem with believing that the rapture or the translation is pictured here in Revelation 4. We're told specifically by Paul that, number one, it's going to be at the last trump. Number two, that we would be meeting the Lord in the air in the clouds. So, in Revelation 4, John does no such thing. He says immediately, he was, he was on the earth, he was on the, in the Isle of Patmos, and then immediately upon hearing the words come up hither, he is immediately in heaven. And there's the throne of God, and one Sat on the throne. I know who that is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. I love that. Your King James Bible says it right. Stupid NIV. Someone was sitting on it. What an idiot who translated that. That's stupid. Here's John going, yeah, I see the throne of God, but be swan if I know who that is sitting on there. Somebody was sitting on it. Well, who was it? I had no idea who was sitting on that. There was just someone. It's ridiculous. 
here's my problem with Revelation 4 being a picture of the rapture. They're not meeting Jesus in the clouds in the air. John is standing before the throne, and here is one sitting on the throne. And so that's, and, and of course, we would know from Revelation 5 that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and we have the Holy Spirit, we have the seven spirits of God, the seven candles of the seven lamps burning with fire. So we have all of that there, but we're not meeting them like halfway, like in the middle, in the clouds, in the air. We're meeting, John is meeting Christ right at the throne, and that's not what Paul said was going to happen. So I just, that's, that's one of my issues with those who espouse a Revelation 4 translation, is that there are some things that are missing from that. And so, and, and am I not asking a legitimate question? I'm not just trying to be critical and nitpicky. Like somebody who, when I said, well, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, the last trump. And somebody wrote me back saying, oh, Hargard, you're so dumb. A trump is different than a trumpet. That's <laughs> it's, it's stupid. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians 13, 1 says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So that's what we do. We look for a second witness. We have Jesus saying, I will come again, John 14. And then we have the double witness of the angel saying he's coming again. So we have two witnesses there that say he is going to do that. Now we have Paul saying in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now we need a second witness. We have a second witness, 1 Corinthians 15. Turn there. And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go on a little journey of looking at a particular number that to me is attached to the understanding of the translation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Here's what I want you to do. Pull out your King James Pure Bible Search software. Type in the word mister, M-Y-S-T-E-R, and then hit an asterisk after that. You're going to be given every occurrence of the word mystery or mysteries. Uh, Matthew 13, 11, Mark 4, 11, Luke 8, 10, Romans 11, 25, Romans 16, 25, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 is mysteries, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, you see all the word mystery or mysteries there. Now, type in just the word mystery, okay? You'll see Mark 4.11, that's 1. Romans 11.25, that's 2. Romans 16.25, that's 3. 1 Corinthians 2.7, that's 4. 1 Corinthians 15.51, that's 5. Fifth occurrence of the word mystery. And, and here's, here's what you can do. Type in the word mystery in your search software, mystery or mysteries. Paul said that the translation was part of the mystery. There are other things things associated with that mystery. You know what one of them is? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He's talking about the bridegroom and the bride. It's part of the mystery. I love that because I'm dealing with that in the Watchman broadcast series, Babylon's Mystery. Okay? So you study mysteries. You'll see it. You'll see uh, in fact, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do this in relation to, I, I, have, I have so many ways I want to go with this, but let's just stop right here, and let's look at the word mystery and see the relevance between all the different ways that this word is used in the Bible and how it corresponds to what and why the translation takes place. I mean, you, you got to think of it. Here is this event that has never been seen 
in the world with the exception of Enoch and Elijah. By the way, how many witnesses? So if you don't believe that anybody is going to be taken from this world to heaven without dying, I got two friends that'll say, uh, you're wrong on that one, buddy. It happened to me and my buddy Enoch here. Elijah and Enoch are your two types, shadows, examples, in samples, written for our learning and our admonition. Two men in the Bible that went from this world to heaven without dying. Both of them. Now, let's, let's look at this word mystery. Let's see what it's related to. Let me do this, all right, Mr. All right, here we go. Matthew 13, 11. What is this in relation to? Um, they asked Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it, uh, un, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's given unto you to know those things. But to them, talking about the Jews, it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not. And hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed, gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes or hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. It wasn't time for Israel, the Jew, to know the mysteries. So God, or Jesus, spake, who is God, spake to them in parables so that they, and then he would give this parable, this symbolic story that really happened. It's full of symbolism, and then he would sit with his disciples and say, here's the meaning of it, okay? And so in this case here, he's teaching them the parable of the seed and the sower, which is really interesting. Because that is precisely what Paul associated the resurrection with. Seed coming up out of the ground in a different form than what it was when it was put into the ground. I am not going to inhabit this same body for all of eternity. No way, no how. I don't want it. The, it's, it's weak, it hurts, it sweats, it stinks. Ugh! Can't see half the time what they put in the ground is not, going, is not going to look like what comes up out of the ground. What a day that will be. Amen? He says the same thing, Mark 4.11, concerning the parables. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Um, Luke 8, 10, the same thing. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others. And so here's this thing. There's this idea that the Gentiles, the Gentile believers, are being blessed by God giving them the knowledge of the mysteries while he's taking Israel and withholding those teachings from them. Look at Romans 11.25, the next place in the sequence, and that's what you see. Romans 11.25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, there's like 22, there's 27 places all together, and I, I like this. 27 places where the Bible uses the word mystery or mysteries. There are 27 books in the New Testament, and the word mystery or mysteries is only in the New Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. Never. And you know what that says to me? By the way, just the word mystery is used 22 times in, in the New Testament, in the whole Bible. And the word 22 is the number for revelation, and every time you find the word mystery, it's revealed to you. So look at Romans eleven twenty five. 25. I would not have you, brethren, I would, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. You know what that is? 
Your conceits are your own thoughts. The word conceit, and when you conceive something, you're conceiving a thought. You are not. Now, you listen to me. This is thus saith the Lord. You are not supposed to try to be wise in your own thinking concerning God, concerning Christ, concerning salvation, concerning the Gentiles, concerning Israel. You're not to be wise in your own conceits. He is telling you, I'm gonna, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Con- and be wise in your own conceits. Learn this. You learn this, and this will be your thoughts concerning what I'm going to do in the last days. And one of the things that we are seeing here, we see it in Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, we're plainly looking at how God is separating the Gentile church from the Jewish church. And by the way, the word church is what's used to describe the congregation of Israel in the Old Testament. I didn't make that up. That's what God said. But there is a clear difference in these first four verses between the believing Gentiles and the unbelieving Jews. But that is only temporary. It's only going to stay that way for a couple of days, if you get my drift there. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, okay? It's only going to stay that way for a couple of days. It's like Jesus being in the tomb. He's dead. But he's only going to stay that way for a couple of days. On the third day, he's going to rise again. So think of it along those lines there. And here he says, I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Do you see it? You see it there, don't you? Clearly, a difference between us Gentiles and unbelieving Jews. They are, they are partially blinded. They're not totally blind. They're partially blinded. How can you be partially blinded? Like this. How many pictures on the internet are taken of people posing like this? They're covering their right eye. Why? Because that's what the spirit of the idle shepherd, which is in them, is telling them. They only see out of the left eye. They're partially blinded. What's on the left side of your Bible? the Old Testament. They can see that. They just can't put it together with what's on the other side of the Bible, the right side. One of these days, and this verse clearly spells that out. Now I can't put my glasses back on. You ever tried to do that? Wear headphones and put your glasses on? It It won't work. Where was I, what was I saying? Anyway, back to the scriptures. Clearly, you have Israel partially blinded, but only for a couple of days. When the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and you know what that, that phrase just sort of gives me the impression of? It's like my daughter, Lindsay. Lindsay's due date is like now, okay? She's going to have a baby any day now. And my wife is ready for it. Lindsay's ready for it. We're all ready for it. And she wants this thing out of her, okay? And you just take one look at her and, and go, that watermelon is ripe. I'm telling you that right now. Okay, that thing is ready to go. And I think that that is like the implication here, the language of it, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The birth, the coming of the Lord. 
I think that there's going to be a time when God is going to be done with the Gentiles. Right now, it's all about the Gentiles. Even Joseph, I mentioned Joseph earlier. Joseph, what does he do? What does he do? When they take him out of prison, what does he do? He's now Lord over all the Gentiles. He marries a Gentile wife, has two kids. There's that number two again, okay? And that two represents the two commandments that you and I are under right now. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. It also references first and second coming. And all these, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, things like that. But anyway, that's, that, here's Joseph, and he's mar- he marries a Gentile bride. But he gets to save his brothers too, doesn't he? And I tell you what, I, I've mentioned it in this week's Watchman broadcast. Uh, somebody pointed it out to me. I have never, up until now, I have never spoken out against anything that I disagreed with this guy about. This one, I cannot let go. He has teamed up with Tex Mars who to me is an infidel. Tex Mars has such a seething hatred for Jews that he does, he does, he's, he's, everybody says, well, he uses the King James Bible. And I would say, not much. Not much. If he would read and believe, if his heart, if he had the Holy Spirit of God giving him light, he would not believe that in the story of the book of Esther, that Haman was the good guy. That's what Tex Mars believes. Haman was the one who uncovered this Zionist plot to take over the world. And Haman was going to expose it and have all of the evil people destroyed. And Esther, that evil Jewish woman, went and told the king, and now the king destroyed the only hope that the world had of re-ridding this entire world of all of the Jews. That's Tex Mars. And Stephen Anderson hooked up with him. And they're putting out a video called Marching to Zion. And the advertisement for the video, Stephen Anderson's own words are, I believe that the Gentile church has replaced Israel. That is... That's, you're, that's a curse. That's, that's like Genesis 12. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And yes, Jews are evil right now. They're the haters of the gospel. They persecuted Paul. They had him killed. They killed Stephen. They've been persecuting the believers, the true believers in Christ for years. There is a evil conspiracy amongst high-ranking Freemason Jews in Israel, no doubt, all you got to do is look at the symbolism of the, uh, of the um, State of Israel's Supreme Court building. But they're only partially blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And what is that? It's part of the mystery. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, you and I, are going to be taken up into heaven to meet Jesus in the air. And God is going to lift the veil of Moses. And the Jews, those who he has reserved unto himself, are going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. God, in fact, is going to seal them with his Holy Spirit of promise. Revelation chapter 7, Ephesians chapter 1. That's what God's going to do. Are they, are they against, contrary to God right now? Yes. Is God contrary to them? To an extent. But one of these days, their eye is going to be opened. The veil is going to be lifted, and they're going to know who, they're, they're going to know who the Lord is. They're going to know that. And to me, it is absolutely irresponsible to sweep all of Israel under the rug trample upon them and say, it's all about us now, baby. What did Joseph say when, his, when he finally revealed himself to his brothers? What did he say to them? 
did he say, well, look, since you guys did that to me, I, you know, I've been, I've been angry all these years. I'm not over it. I probably will never get over it. I mean, yeah, okay, I won't let you starve to death. But I'm not really here for you. So why don't you just get some food and go back home and leave me alone because my people are now these Egyptians. Joseph didn't say that. No way. You know what he told his brothers? Don't worry, guys. I'm here to be your savior. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. You know what he was saying? You know what Joseph realized? Joseph realized that everything that he had gone through all of his life from 17 years old and on to this day, God was bringing him to such a point as to where he could be the savior of his own brethren. And for any anybody, any person who says they're a believer in the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ, for them to think that Christ is only all about us and poor Israel, they'll just have to fend for themselves. I'll throw something else in on the mix. I've heard, and I've, I've consulted with two different men, three, three different men who characterize themselves as dispensationalists. All three of them, when I said um, I was told by dispensationalists that they believe that Israel must be saved by works. And all three of these men said, no, no. Israel gets saved by grace just like everybody else does. I was glad to hear that. I really was. Because these three men I love dearly in the Lord. I was glad to hear that from them. But anyway, the mystery is going to be done one of these days, and Israel is going to see. But right now, they're blinded. Romans 16, 25. The Bible says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. It's pretty much the last thing that Paul said in Romans. But he said that the preaching of Jesus Christ and revealing Jesus is the revelation of the mystery. And that's my point. You and I, we have it revealed to us now. The Jews don't. But he will be when the mystery is finished. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden mystery, wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why did God have to keep the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus? Why did he have to keep that a secret before Christ came? He just tells you here. Because if he would have made it known that that was the plan. Principalities, the princes of this world would have never let it happen. He said, for had they known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. Think about Satan. Think about the devil. He's a beast. Beasts don't understand everything. You can trick a beast. You can fool a beast. You can conceal things from a beast. You don't believe that? Ask any turkey hunter. Anybody that goes out and hunts turkeys. When you go out hunting turkeys, you don't wear a, a white or, a, a, let's see, you don't wear a white t-shirt, pink bell-bottom blue jeans, I just made that up, and a big old cowboy hat. Why? Turkeys have got a brain this big, but their eyes never miss a thing. Turkey's smartest animal in the woods. So guys, when they go out and turkey hunt, if they're not hunting in a blind, they cover themselves with camo, camouflage. They paint their face, cam or they wear a net over their head because if a turkey sees even just the hint of a human being sitting over there, they're gone. 
but you can deceive turkeys. You can deceive deer. And this is really, this is so cool to me. How is it that the devil, who God said is wiser than Daniel, how is it that he didn't know what the plan was? Even when we look, now when you and I, who have the mystery revealed to us, when we look back in the Old Testament, we can see the lamb slain. We can see the purpose of the blood. We can see him hanging on a tree and he's cursed. We can see all of those things there in the Old Testament because we have it revealed to us in the new. The mystery's over for us. How is it that the devil didn't see that? Isn't he wiser than Daniel? Yeah. But just like my dad taught me, here, son, wear this orange cap and this orange vest. We're going deer hunting. But dad... You can see this from a mile away. Won't the deer see the orange cap and the orange vest? No, son. Deer cannot discern that color. To them, it looks tan. Or it looks like any other color in the field or in the woods. I promise you, son, deer can't see it. And I'm just going, that is so cool. Deer can't see orange. That's awesome. This is why orange growers in uh, Florida don't have a problem with deer eating out of their trees. Can't see it. <laughs> anyway, the mystery was there so that the princes of this world, think of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. It was there and in place so that they couldn't determine that by killing Christ or having Christ crucified, that was going to bring about their defeat. Had they known that, they would have never, J Satan would have never entered into Judas. By the way, I put out an article on, on Facebook uh, last week, week before last, something like that. I told you I've been looking into the, the strange doctrines of, of Finis or Finis Dake, who is the grandfather of the word faith witchcraft heresy, charismatic movement. Dake says that there is no way that the devil ever, ever entered into and inhabited the physical body of Judas Iscariot. He said it never happened. Never happened. And yet there's two places in the Bible that said Satan entered into Judas. He said, the thing is, the word into doesn't really mean putting himself like into it. It means that he was in agreement with his purpose, but he wasn't actually inhabiting Judas. He said, after all, it's impossible because we know the devil has a physical body and there's no way that a physical body can inhabit another physical body. Well, listen, Mr. Idiot Dake, Jesus said that there would be people who would become coming inhabiting sheep's clothing, but inwardly they were ravening wolves. What do you think about that? But anyway, Judas would have never been inhabited by Satan had Satan figured out that in Judas betraying Jesus and then Jesus subsequently being whipped with stripes, crown of thorns planted upon his head, nailed to the cross until he died, that that in itself and his resurrection would have sealed his doom. He would have never done it. So that's why the mystery was there. So that leads me to believe that there are still things that are not known, let's say, to principalities or devils, and maybe even to Israel, things that are not known for whatever reason, that have to do with the translation. Just a theory that I have. Maybe wrong. Uh, let's look at, uh, let's see here. Let's look at, oh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. From what I can see, the way the word mystery is used here goes along with the other places that the word, in other words, there's not, like six or seven different, completely different, not related to any other mystery. There's not that in the Bible. There are different aspects of the same mystery. It's like, how many Gospels are there? One. 
but that one gospel has different ways of describing it or different terminologies used around it. And that is only just another way of saying it's the gospel, period. One gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of righteousness, the gospel of Paul. is one gospel. Uh, let's see here. Let's look here. Da, da, da. Let's see how many. Oh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Going to run out of time here in a little bit. As unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Another thing Finnis Dake says. He says the church nowhere in the Bible is ever referred to as a woman. And I'm just going, okay, that's just, that's just stupid. Anyway, uh, for the husband is the head of wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Ladies, you pray about that. You pray about God's application in your life for those verses. I'm not your judge, and nobody else should be either. Over the years, I've seen some bad husbands. And I mean bad husbands. Evil, very evil men. So much so that their wife and children was in danger. I've seen that. And I don't have an answer to why God allows that or what God does with that or whatever. And so I can't judge everybody or every woman and the circumstances they're in. I can't judge. It's not my place to judge. That's between you and God. You'll submit yourself to God. God will honor you. God will bless you. Okay? You think about that. Husbands, the same way. Submit yourselves into God. I've seen some. Don't get me started on Jezebel wives. Oh my goodness. Uh, study Ephesians 5. Study the mysteries. We'll be back Thursday with more of this. I'm going to read some emails when I go off the air here. See what y'all got to say. It's good to be with you. I love you. I love that Bible. I do. You know, fault me for anything. I love that book. It's got everything in it we need to know. And if you're upset because I won't go read somebody else's blog, you just have to stay upset. All right? Anyway, Pure Bible Study coming out tomorrow, Wednesday night Bible Study, Thursday Pastor Mike Online. Next Sunday, we are, I already have um, part four of Babylon's Mystery, and there's more to come. So anyway, we'll see you. Bye.